Hi, I'm Catherine Reed Day, and coming up next on the St. Paul Forum, I'm talking with Pat Plonsky and Tom Gita about the Books for Africa project. That's next on the St. Paul Forum. Welcome to the St. Paul Forum. I'm Catherine Reed Day. And joining me today are Pat Plonsky and Tom Gita of Books for Africa. Welcome. Thank you, Catherine. Thanks for coming Thank today. You. Um, Pat, tell us a little bit. I was amazed to realize this week that um, Books for Africa is 25 years old. And it has roots here and elsewhere. But uh, tell us just briefly, how did Books for Africa get started? Well, yes, so we're happy to be celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, and we'll be having a big celebration here in St. Paul for that. Uh, we started 25 years ago when our founder, Tom Worth, traveled uh, to a library in Jinja, Uganda, and he was very surprised to find that there were almost no books there. And so, so it was a library, but there were no books. Exactly. Okay. There were very few books. There were okay. a few books. Uh, they, they took pains to point out that they had some books, uh, but it was very uh, small and they were dated. And so Tom uh, was active with the publishing uh, folks. He was an automobile car publisher, just sold his business. So he came back to Minnesota in 1988, met with some other publishers, and they created Books for Africa, and the first books were sent to Jinja, Uganda. And as I say, that was 28 million books ago. So, 28 million books ago. Yes. So, Tom, tell us a little bit about your involvement with Books of, for, for Africa. How did you come to be part of this story? Yeah, actually, um, I've been uh, in the U.S. for a number of years now. Came here for college and uh, started working here and eventually started uh, an African newspaper uh, called Mshale. So uh, we normally cover activities related to the African community here in the state. Uh, and then also people are doing things related to Africa. Uh, so in the course of uh, uh, you know, just our regular news coverage, uh, I chanced upon uh, Books for Africa about 10 years ago. Uh, and actually the way that happened was uh, the founder, Tom Worth, uh, subscribed uh, to our newspaper. Oh, okay. very nice. So the yeah. publishing connection continued. Yes, okay. yes, he subscribed to our newspaper and then uh, he sent me a note, I believe, uh, you know, of an activity that Books for Africa was doing. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we, I ended up attending just as, a, I think, I believe it was just in my private capacity, not as, a, you know, as newspaper or anything. And I fell in love with uh, Books for Africa, obviously, uh, uh, because of the mission and, mm -hmm. what, and what it was it, it's doing. Uh, so ever since, uh, you know, ever after that initial contact, uh, we just started covering pretty much uh, most of the events that uh, Books for Africa does. Uh, so whenever they have a um, fundraiser, they might have a barbecue sometimes, uh, uh, you know, we will go there and we'll cover, take some photos, you know, put in the paper. And uh, that's really how my involvement started uh, about uh, t going to 10 years now, wow. I believe, yes. Wonderful. Yeah. You know, let's, let's talk about this mission because I think it's hard for some people to possibly get their heads around why is it so important to send our books so far away. Uh, and I, I really felt in listening to the story of the organization mm -hmm. at the event I attended that it really became clear. But maybe, Pat, can you talk a little bit sure. about that? Well, I think it's important because the books that we have here in Minnesota and across North America may not be useful to us anymore. They may, uh, for whatever reason, they, they may be, uh, typically they've been in a private library, they've been read and they're sitting on a shelf or in a school or library environment, they, there may be a doer book that's out. A university student may be done with it. Uh, so we have books here that are useful, that are very useful in Africa. And so the trick is to get the right books to the right people, and so that they indicate what they want. And then we collect all kinds of books from all kinds of people 
and organizations. We sort them by volunteers and then take orders and get them to the right people. And uh, it has been very successful from the standpoint that uh, uh, people on the receiving end in Africa have indicated that yes, these books are useful and we've been able to cash flow it and make it work financially and logistically and working with people like Tom and the African diaspora as well as mm -hmm. many people who've been to Africa, Peace Corps volunteers and, and corporations, mm -hmm. we're able to uh, make, get the books to the right people. You know, uh, that topic of the diaspora, I think, first of all, could you define that so that our audience knows what that means? Um, either one of you, what is, and from maybe from your own personal experience? Yeah, uh, for, for those of us who are like, let's say, diaspora actually c can include pretty much anybody who was um, as ancestry back in Africa. Uh, so typically for us, black people. Okay, so it can also include African Americans, mm -hmm. but for for most for most practical purposes, when we say African diaspora, uh, for us we tend to refer actually to uh, people like myself, maybe, uh, who just came uh, uh, from Africa uh, either voluntarily or refugees, and are now based here. Um, uh, you know, in the last maybe 25, 30, or 40 years, not necessarily connected to the slave trade, for example. Right, okay. but related to other conflicts in, uh, or opportunities? I mean, is it Correct. kind of both? And yeah, it's, it's both, because mm -hmm. like myself, I came here voluntarily. I came for uh, you came college. For college I, came, like I came for college and I ended up staying. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some, you know, most Kenyans, that's how most Kenyans came here. Uh, but maybe most Somalians uh, uh, came as refugees, for example, right. Liberians, Ethiopians, Ethiopians mm -hmm. as well. Uh, so it's a whole mix, uh, but for us, when we say African diaspora, we tend to s to refer to the people who were born in Africa uh, that are here now. Okay, thank okay. you. Yes. It's great to have that definition, mm -hmm. this because we're all on the same page, because yes. I'm not even sure I would have yeah. had that definition, yes, so yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, the part that I wanted, to, in terms of the mission, there was a statistic that I just heard that you shared, which has to do with what's coming because of the change in the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. And, and globally what that means. So could you talk a little bit about what I, you know what I'm referring to, which is the youth of where our youthful yeah. population will yeah. be and what that means for our future? Yeah, well, uh, Africa's a very young continent. Uh, and, and Tom can tell you more about probably the specific figures, but uh, to make a long story short, it, it's, it's a very young continent and as a result, uh, there's a, a lot Young of in terms of human age. Yeah, not exactly, in terms exactly. Of, not in terms of the way we think That's of right, the country. That's right, exactly, exactly. The people rather. there are, mm -hmm. are um, uh, younger as a demographic than, mm -hmm. than in uh, the United States or Europe or somewhere like that. And so there's, I think, as a result, dramatic need for educational content. And whether the content is provided in books or digital or, or you know, electronic format, uh, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is that there's a need for information and educational content. We find that books remain, for now, the most cost-effective way to deliver educational content. We are looking at other means of delivering content, things like digital content, e-readers, computers, and things of that nature. But for now, uh, as I say, the, the book is the coin of the realm. It's the most useful, it's the most cost-effective, and so most of what we are sending is in the form of books. What really touched me, though, was the notion that there are children, and I'll just put it around, since I attended your event and, and the uh, ambassador spoke mm -hmm. uh, from South Africa, um, he really was talking about uh, the idea of uh, both economic development and peace mm -hmm. As, and that these books are that tool. Mm -hmm. And those two things really touched my spirit. Mm -hmm. Since then, I watched, my daughter is in high school and she needed to watch um, Blood Diamond, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. I had also recent, I had seen that movie many years ago when it first came out. Since then, I've read some Sierra Leone books, including uh, Bite of the Mango, which is an incredible memoir by a young woman whose two mm -hmm. arms were cut off. This idea that a child may have never touched a book and that this project affects us in that way. Could you speak to that that combination of education, economics, and peace? Yeah, uh, education is very important. Um, it's what can um, 
uh, prevent conflict in, in, in direct way, both direct and indirect ways. Uh, there's a story, I'm actually, somebody told me the story of uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, you know, was it, when he was in prison all those years. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he came out, he was asked, hey, how are you able to survive all these years? And he said they, he kept reading this one book over and over again. That's what uh, kept him connected. And you have to remember Nelson Mandela was in actually uh, in isolation. He was uh, solitary confinement for most of the time that he was uh, he's in prison. And the way he survived, he said, is because there's this one book that he had been given that he kept reading on and on again. So books normally have a very, um, if, you know, if you're probably a reader like I am, books tend to have a very emotional connection to people. And uh, it's really the way to impart knowledge. And that knowledge uh, opens you to other worlds that you do not, you know, you, that were not possible, not just your own. And it can show you what is possible. So beyond uh, just what you're learning in school, uh, people tend to read a lot, obviously have a, a better worldview, and uh, they'll tend to, um, uh, the, what's the word I'm trying to look for? They'll tend to avoid, you know, not avoid conflict, but they will be more influenced, curious, curious mm -hmm. uh, to see what is out there beyond what is being presented to them mm -hmm. uh, locally in the form of conflict and the like, and mm -hmm. also just broaden their horizons. Mm -hmm. uh, so for countries that if you even look at uh, different parts of Africa, the, the higher the education level of most of the African countries, uh, the more educated the population, uh, there is actually some kind of correlation with how conflict is being managed in those part particular countries. Mm -hmm. uh, the, where conflict is a lot, uh, where there is a high level of conflict, uh, the education levels have actually been disrupted for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have not had time to catch up uh, to education, to raise up the standards of education for their people, for our people, for those specific countries, uh, which has affected, which has become a breeding ground uh, for a lot of conflict. If you remember what the uh, uh, ambassador was saying of mm -hmm. South Africa, was that you know we need to take care of the youth because the, the youth have become, uh, can become easily breeding grounds for, for conflict, you know, influence for politicians, you know, people right. are busy mm -hmm. trying to plant the seed of uh, discontent and the like. So that's, you know, mm -hmm. we're just playing our little role in that. It's, it's very, um, uh, very interesting. And he used the term end the book famine. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. one of the things, again, that you, you, what was the first number you just gave us? Uh, how many million books later? Yeah, we've sent over 28 million 28 books million. to 49 mm -hmm. countries. Much of which, and again, you're in two locations. Is it, Minnesota is the founding yes, uh, yeah, founder, but you're also St. Paul, literally, and then mm -hmm. uh, Atlanta is the other. Atlanta is our, our large warehouse. Is in you Atlanta, have a warehouse so there. we okay. have an office in Lower Town, St. Paul, here, and then we have a warehouse uh, at University in Pryor, uh, sort of a regional collection site for books, and then. Uh, we have a large warehouse in Atlanta where uh, everything's collected and palletized and, and shipped to Africa. If you're just joining us, I'm talking with Pat Polanski and Tom Gita about books for Africa. So there's this notion of, uh, when you're thinking about it, again, I have a hard time. I have a lot of books. I need to get rid of a lot of books. Mm -hmm. We know where they're going next. But, um, you know, the physical aspects of books, books are heavy, um, you know, yeah. Uh, all the things, and and again, there are multiple ways for people to participate. Can we just talk a little bit about these logistics that you've figured sure. out with that mm -hmm. many books? And I want to talk because um, I have interviewed Jote Tedesse on the show, and uh, we talked only a little bit. Uh, they can look it up online. You know, there's a archive of the interviews. But he talked about his passion for this uh, work because of his experience coming from Ethiopia. Um, you know, it's helping people understand both ends of this, both the physical aspects mm -hmm. of getting a container of books over mm -hmm. and all the sorting and things you're talking about, mm -hmm. but what happens on the other end as well. Right, so right. maybe you can take the front end sure. and mm -hmm. you can take the back end? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, you said it right. Books are heavy and uh, it costs money to move them around, mm -hmm. but it's still cost effective. To, it's more cost effective to move existing books than it is cost effective to reprint books and they have to be moved also because much of the publishing now for economic reasons takes place in China and in India. Uh, there's still publishing in Europe and the United States and very good publishers everywhere. But uh, 
books are moved around in, 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 you know, under any circumstance. We just happen to move them to Africa from the United States. So the logistics are that, yeah, we, you know, we probably have about two million books or more in our warehouse in Atlanta in inventory at any given time. Last year we moved about 2.2 million books to 22 African countries. The biggest recipients of those books were Nigeria and Ethiopia, uh, which happened to be the two largest population centers on the African continent also. So that makes sense. Oh, they sense. are the two largest. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I didn't realize that yeah, about Africa Ethiopia. Yeah, Africa is number, number one. Uh, mm -hmm. as some Nigerians say, if you haven't been to Nigeria, you haven't been to Africa, Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it is such an important country. Such a large, yeah, yeah. and it I did not one, realize. Yeah, one, one in four African uh, people in Africa right now, in the continent, one in four Africans is a Nigerian. Really? Yes, wow. Yes, yeah, okay. And English over 100 million. And, e and English that's speaking. Another, and English yeah. speaking, too, which right. I mm -hmm. think is another, I mean, yeah. I think there's so many yeah. things we have to re-educate ourselves yeah. about, too, yeah. so the that's helpful, too. Sort of as the, um, you know, the old British Commonwealth countries, uh, English was left behind mm -hmm. as a, uh, as a sort of a unifying force, I think, in, in countries, a unifying language. And so even after, uh, uh, you know, the Europeans went home, the, the language continued to, uh, continues to be used uh, by Africans as it's deemed useful as a unifying force. Um, but not everywhere. Somewhere it's Arabic, some places it's French, some places uh, indigenous languages are, are enough of a unifying mm -hmm. force. But uh, uh, where English is spoken, uh, English books are needed, and so that tends to be places like uh, Nigeria and Ethiopia, Ghana, a number of other countries. There's probably 10 to 15 countries where English is prevalent and we send a lot of books. And then there's other countries where maybe other languages are prevalent, but they want to learn English because it's uh, sort of a gateway into the world economy and tourism and things of that nature. So to have English Mm -hmm. uh, is deemed uh, on the African continent as, as a useful skill, wouldn't mm -hmm. you say, Tom? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Actually, there's actually a lot of important things, uh, important developments going on right now in Africa. Uh, so, for example, uh, some of the major countries, like if you take Senegal, for example, Senegal uh, is French-speaking. Mm -hmm. But uh, of late, uh, they have actually been uh, aggressively uh, trying to, and uh, actually President Obama is visiting there early next month, uh, July. Uh, they just announced, uh, the White House just announced two days ago that uh, the president will be visiting Senegal, uh, Tanzania, and uh, South Africa uh, a week before July 4th. Wow. So, uh, you know, so Senegal has been really uh, g getting aggressive in getting English books uh, and, and promoting the speaking of English in there because they are recognizing uh, that, you know, English is, you know, is especially if you're doing trade with the United States, for example, English is important, so mm -hmm. they have started uh, having that as one of the languages that they are promoting aggressively there. And Rwanda actually, uh, uh, which has been French speaking for many years, uh, as since uh, the uh, genocide, after the genocide, uh, they have really gone more into adopting English as their preferred language now. Uh, because also they are very well, in they just got integrated into what we call the East African community and uh, East African community is mostly English speaking, mm -hmm. uh, which includes, uh, it's modeled almost kind of like the European Union for right. that region. So okay. they have started adopting English. And more. we can and we can put our minds around that too, around uh, just this morning, uh, there's a conversation about uh, politics in Minneapolis mm -hmm. and the nomination uh, or the endorsement of a uh, someone from, I forget which country, but he's... Somalia. He's, he's Somalia. Yes, okay. Yes. And uh, that it is an East African community mm -hmm. from which... So, again, I think we can mm -hmm. just make these... What I love is that we can make these associations to um, bring it down mm -hmm. to us yeah. physically yes, here, yes, but yeah. this very distant relationship. Mm -hmm. So there's this sort of breathing back and forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, just briefly, I want to, because I want to make sure we cover just a couple things. Mm -hmm. So you have you need a, a, an army of volunteers. You need an army of donors, and no book is irrelevant at this point. You'll decide if they're irrelevant. Yeah. So there are places to drop them off, and will that be yeah. something we can just put up on the website yeah. where they absolutely. where they donate those? Yeah, absolutely. And then, uh, but then there's this sorting. I'm curious about this sorting and cataloging process. Mm -hmm. So um, is that something that volunteers do? That they and and I'm kind of thinking about my neighborhood. 
um, secondhand bookshop, which I can mm -hmm. go online and look up what they have, whether mm -hmm. they have the book mm -hmm. I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Is that something you're doing where you said they order a certain kind yeah. of book? Is it more like an age range? Is it subjects? Mm -hmm. What? How does that work? Well, the books come in, as you say, in all kinds, and, and some are useful, some are less useful. Publishers are donating books also. Mm -hmm. It all comes together ultimately to our warehouse in Atlanta where the first sort is whether this book is useful in Africa, yes or no. Mm -hmm. If the answer is no, it goes into recycling, and probably a third of the books go into recycling, and that's and okay. That's, that's true of uh, if you were to go to uh, yeah. sec half price yeah. books, uh, they're going to recycle exactly. a number of your the, books the too. The goal isn't mm -hmm. to send every book uh, to Africa, whether it's useful or not. The goal is to send books that are useful. And yeah. so the first question is, is this book useful? If the answer is yes, then it goes into inventory. And we to keep it simple, we have approximately four categories and then a number of subcategories, things like primary level math or mm -hmm. university level yeah. uh, geography, things of that nature. And then, so then when the orders come in from Africa, they select based on some 30, 35 categories, and then uh, that's how we fill their orders. Great. And then uh, another way for them to help is to you could purchase, uh, you're trying to raise the money f to ship mm -hmm. a container and mm -hmm. can you just give us a flat number for what that's, that goal looks like? Do you talk yeah. about that dollar? It, it uh, varies depending on where the container is okay. going. So Tom yeah. is originally from Mombasa, Kenya. Mm -hmm. We can send a container of 22,000 books. That's a, well, it's about the that's size a of a yeah. semi-trailer truck. Right. So we can put that in Mombasa for $10,300. Okay. If Tom were from uh, Juba, Sudan, that price might go up to $25,000. Oh. So, so that a big range. It's, mm -hmm. continent's a, it's a big it's continent. It's a huge continent. And to, and but the huge. cheapest, uh, uh, best uh, way to get books to Africa is, is actually to serve the water ports, which is an issue that we grapple with because that means more geographically remote areas are, uh, you know, have less education. It's mm -hmm. nothing Which new is, in the world. Uh, but, but it's it, a it's, challenge. Yeah. And then I want to talk about that other end, and, and your, your, uh, we'll have maybe a few pictures from the Ugandan project mm -hmm. that we'll show. So some people are physically helping you build libraries in Africa. Some of people are helping create the welcome party, essentially, for the books themselves. And then there's also the task, which Jote talks about, which is helping actually make sure that that library is staffed and cared for mm -hmm. in the long run. Uh, how do you see all of that? Yeah, Tom? yes, actually. So so there are actually two two sides here. So there is uh, this part here where we do our best uh, to get the books uh, collected, uh, mm -hmm. sorted out and right. packaged and put in the container on the on the boat. Uh, once they reach on the other side, they, they are other partners on the other side, the recipients. Uh, so, for example, um, like uh, what we talked at our last event, uh, what the Uganda project. So there has to be somebody on the other end who is going to receive the books uh, and make sure that uh, they get into the proper schools and the libraries that they need to get to. And these are normally very dedicated people. I think the good thing with Books for Africa and why I really love working with Books for Africa is um, we don't dictate where the books are going. Uh, typically, uh, somebody finds us. Uh, in this case, it can be the diaspora that we just talked mm -hmm. about, or uh, um, Americans who have traveled to Africa, uh, to a specific village maybe, or a specific school, and they come back and they say, man, you know, I just went to this library and there are just no books, just like the founder yeah. did back in 88. Mm -hmm. So they'll come find us and then we'll work something out and see how best to get the books to that particular village or school, uh, but uh, that particular village or school has to participate actively with us in uh, in filling out what do you need. Mm -hmm. uh, as Pat said, there are four subcategories. Uh, we they are the ones who have to tell us, okay, we are actually looking specifically for math, for primary level or secondary mm -hmm. level, uh, high school uh, science books. Uh, that's what we need. So so we can. Send can, things they actually can get need, those things there. Uh, mm -hmm. because when you send something that people have actually asked for, they are more likely to be taken care take of care and of, yeah. uh, sort, you know, put in the proper library and stuff like that. So that's what happens. On the other end, they receive them. It's normally a big celebration for most of uh, the recipients. Uh, it's uh, it can take the form of even. Uh, 
a big party actually mm -hmm. you know because the truck can come in you know carrying the whole container and then they might even they might even call it a, a, day, a day off for school almost like a snow day for us <laughs> over here uh, because the it's books book have day. arrived yes okay. you know library day. yeah and then they will uh, you know distribute the books so mm -hmm. you'll see pictures of uh, kids carrying the boxes uh, you know, carry mm -hmm. uh, containing the books, and then uh, they'll all and be assigned. And then they physically have them in their hands. They'll have them in their minds and put them out in the different shelves that they go to. It's 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 quite an event, to and be honest sure with you. Sure, it's phenomenal. It's quite yeah. an event. Wonderful. Yes. So the 25th anniversary is coming up. Do you have a date for that event yet? That yep. is. Yep, we do actually have the privilege of uh, co-chairing that with my friend Doris. Um, yeah, the, oh, September 20 is the big gala. We actually, we have related events like the event you just attended uh, with the South African ambassador last week. Uh, that's actually part of the 25th anniversary theme right. for, for this year. So you're in the uh, process yes. of getting that message Correct. out. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we, we are uh, you know, slowly celebrating with small, small activities along the, along the way. But the big day is uh, Friday, September 20, uh, at the Crown Plaza here in uh, uh, on Kellogg Wonderful. in St. Paul. Wonderful. Uh, you know, and if you go to booksforafrica.org slash events, uh, you can get a ticket there. And, uh, sponsor you a table. Uh, sponsor a table. Become a... Uh, uh, come join us. We'll buy a, a container. Uh, there'll be um, a bazaar. There'll mm -hmm. be a bazaar of all Af of African artifacts that you can buy. There'll be an African fashion show. Uh, they will, you know, of course, they, they'll be, uh, we even actually worked very closely with the Crown Plaza, which is new for them. Uh, they'll have an African-inspired uh, cuisine for that day, which is mm -hmm. very rare, mm -hmm. you know, for a lot of these uh, <laughs> uh, chain hotels. But yes. uh, they made an exception for us, and uh, we're looking forward to the big day. So uh, booksforafrica.org slash events. Okay, we'll put mm -hmm. that up. Yeah. So it's an opportunity for people to both honor the relationship to St. Paul mm -hmm. and to Africa and uh, to be part of Books for Africa. Thank you very much. That's all we have time for. Come join us again next week. <laughs>